Is Logic Pro for iPad right for you? That's what we're going to be covering in this video. I've been using it for about two weeks now, so I've got some thoughts on the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I'm going to give it to you warts and all in this show. This is the Studio Live Today podcast. My name is Pete Johns, and if you'd like to find out all the ways you can follow me, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel, you can subscribe to the audio version of this podcast, jump on over to studiolivetoday.com. All the links you need are right there. Let's not beat around the bush, shall we? Let's dive straight in. Where has we come from here? Well, Logic Pro has just been released for the iPad. It is Apple's flagship digital audio workstation. So it's their recording software that the professionals use. If you've used GarageBand on your iPhone or your iPad, or maybe on a Mac, this is the step up from that. So these are the folks I'm probably talking to here, but we'll have some interesting information for anyone who may be considering Logic Pro on iPad. So as I mentioned, I've been using Logic Pro for about two weeks. I got early access thanks to Apple. So I got to put that out there on Front Street that I did get an early access copy. So I've had the privilege of playing around with this for a couple of weeks. I found some things that I really love about it. And I found some things that maybe could be done better. But remember, this is version 1.0. This is the first version of some brand new software. So let's dive in. What's good about Logic Pro? Why should you consider it? Because it is, it's a, it's a subscription model. Maybe that will be talked about a bit later. It is $4.99 per month US or $49.99 per year, or maybe slightly more or less depending on your currency and where you live. The number one thing that I love about Logic Pro since using it is the workflow. Yeah, the browser that we have in Logic Pro allows you to have access to all of your instruments, all your audio patches, your loops, your samples, your plug-in presets. Everything is in one place. Even things that like your, your presets you can throw onto plugins and access to the sound library. So it is different from other things, especially if you're coming from GarageBand. But I've just found that having everything there and when you go to start a new track, just being able to find a sound and drag it directly into your workspace. It's just an easier way. It's a better workflow than having to go new track, scroll across, find your instrument, or, well, that's GarageBand, but whatever it is in other digital audio workstations. So I really love the browser, the ability to have everything there at your fingertips. It's been very cool. Number two, by, which is definitely, and these are in no order, by the way, these are just sort of my observations, the mixer. The mixer is epic. The mixer has a whole bunch of great things you can do. It gives you a great visibility of all of your tracks in one place. Add and remove plugins. You can do your panning. You can do your volumes, your fades, your mutes, your solos. Everything is right there at your fingertips. And when I say mixer, there's a couple of things that Logic Pro does really well that let's just say GarageBand and perhaps some other platforms that do not. Number one being a master fader. Yes, you can adjust your stereo out and you can actually adjust how much volume is going out. That's something you can't do in GarageBand and that causes a lot of problems, especially with things like the auto normalization, which is another thing that Logic has. So I, I include that in the mixer because you can set to auto normalize or not. Now, auto normalization means that it's going to lift the volume of your project or sometimes compress or squash your volume to get it to the maximum volume without going over without clipping. Now that's great when you're starting out, but when you're a more experienced mixer, you want to have the freedom to not auto normalize, which you have here in Logic Pro. Metering is part of that mixer as well. So you can actually see all of the different values, the actual decibel levels, your dB of everything. You've got LUFS metering. You've got the ability to see where your mix is at. So you're not going to clip on any individual channel and you're not going to clip on your overall master fader. So mixer for the win for GarageBand. The overall interface, number three, the overall interface of Logic Pro. Did I say GarageBand? I meant Logic Pro. I'm going to say GarageBand by mistake a lot. In case you're new to the channel, GarageBand's kind of been my spirit animal for a long time. So it's taking me some time to adapt to saying Logic Pro. There will be mistakes. Number three is the interface. I love the interface. I love having panels that you can pull out and put away so that when you're actually doing something, you can have access to exactly what you need, your editor window, your plugins, your mixer. And then when you want to get back to business and start recording again, you put it all away. You're not having floating windows over the top of other things. You're not having things that are getting in the way of your creativity. You pop them out when you need them. You want to play in a part, you pop out. 
your play surface, and then when you're done, you put it away. It's like when you're a kid, you've got to put away your toys. Same when you're creating music in a digital audio workstation, you've got to put away your panels when you're done playing with them. Number four is the customization that you can do. So there are so many things that you can customize. So you can customize both the layout of how you how you want everything to be, as we've talked about before. You can customize your individual tracks. You can customize out the wazoo. You've got track icons. You've got colors. Yes, you can change the colors of your track. You've got the ability to make Logic Pro kind of your own. So that however you work, whether you're a Live Loops user or whether you're a Tracks View user, whether you like to have everything the same color, maybe you like everything gray, you, maybe there's people out there that maybe want everything gray, or you want it to be all the colors of the bow, dude. Whichever way you want to work, it's there for you. Heaps of customization features in Logic Pro. Number five has got to be the plugins. So there are so many plugins in Logic Pro and they are all really high quality. Apple have put a lot of thought and a lot of effort into these. It's sim even simple things like your channel EQ, you've just got so many options in there to actually play around with and uh, adjust your adjust your plugins. You can add a heap of plugins on every channel. You can use things like sends and receives to have your reverb outside of each individual track. You don't have to just load up each track with plugins. You can set up a reverb bus and then send a certain amount of each channel to that bus. So it just gives you that flexibility that you don't have when you're using some other digital audio workstations. You've also got great visibility here. There's two ways to view your plugins. You've got a nice plugin tile view where you can actually just adjust things on the fly and a quick double tap will take you into a fully fledged view of your plugin with, again, everything. You want to customize, you're the sort of knob twiddler, you can do that. But don't be fooled because there's also presets. Again, we mentioned those plugin presets uh, over here in the, the browser. You can jump over and you can check out all the plugin presets and there's a heap of them that you can throw and it's as easy as dragging them, dropping straight onto your plugin and it is done. It's a great workflow. It's working well for me so far. I like it. Number six. Apple have done a lot of work to make sure that the transition from wherever you're coming from is going to be easy. And the number one thing they've done for that is the lessons. There are some fabulous lessons that are right there in Logic Pro. You can actually load them up and you can go through each one. They're about five minutes to maybe 15 minutes and they go through individual topics and tell you, hey, here's how you do this. Here's how you use the beat breaker. Here's how you use sample alchemy. Here's how you use the mixer. And even just doing these, I've learned a heap about how to actually get things done. You want to go to the next level? Well, yeah, there's also a complete manual available, a complete Logic Pro manual. It's more than 900 pages, which means they're not messing around. Anything you want to know about Logic Pro but we're afraid to ask, you can find in the Logic Pro manual. So the lessons in the user guide, that's my number six. Good thing. Number seven, tempos. Now, this sounds like something really simple, but one of the limitations of a lot of recording software is that the tempo can only be dialed in at a whole number. Now, that really doesn't work. If you're maybe bringing in a sample from something that hasn't been recorded to a click track, or you're trying to beat match, or you're trying to get something right in the right spot, maybe you need to be 122.3 BPM instead of 122 or 123. Well, Logic Pro allows you to do that, and I think it even goes up to four decimal places. So even if you decide to tap in a tempo, and it's a really wacky tempo, your tempo might be 97.6964. You don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got complete control over exactly what your tempo is going to be, which is important because it just gets... Have you ever done that thing where it's like, oh, this song needs to be somewhere between 99 and 100, and you want it to be 99.5? You you go. You, 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 you go, you freaky freak. <laughs> uh, so yeah, if you're a freaky freak like me and you like different tempos, you can do that. The same, number eight, is our time signatures. Have I, have I got my numbers out of order? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven... That was eight. So this is number nine, as I was saying. Number nine is our time signatures. And our time signatures are cool because we can actually put in anything we like. So forget your four, four, three, four, six, eight. What if you want a five, four? What if you want a seven, eight? What if you want anything at all? You can actually dial it in and have any time signature. You go your hardest. Make it as wacky and as weird as you want. Time signatures can be adjusted in Logic Pro, which again... Not always the case. I've, some some DAWs have the ability to just dial in whatever you want, but a lot of them 
don't. Just keep in mind that things like your loops won't always line up if you're going anything but 4-4. A lot of your loops and samples and other things are designed around a 4-4 for a standard time. So there is that to keep in mind. And number 10, automation. Yeah, yeah. So GarageBand and uh, again, other entry-level DAWs have added automation. GarageBand didn't have automation for the longest time on iOS. It now has it. But we have the ability to automate not just your volume. You can actually automate everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Your volume, your panning, your solos, your mutes, your effects, your bus sends, all of it. And you can even go into your plugins and automate individual components of that plugin. So if you, you, you've wanted to do that cool thing where you've got like a filter sweep, go into your EQ and automate your filter. Like this is the sort of stuff we can do in Logic Pro. It's next level in terms of the ability to be creative and create things. And I'm going to give you a bonus. I'm going to give you a number 11, and that is the auto drummer. Now, the auto drummer in GarageBand and in other apps that I've used in the past is fine. It's fine. It does the job. Anders, Kyle, Mason, all the crew, they're good, they're fine. But the auto drummer that we have access to in Logic Pro is just next level because you can use things like the drum kit designer to really, really customize the the plays, the, the patterns that you're putting in there. You've got a heap more options in your auto drummer to actually change things up. There's a lot of different things that you can do to just really customize the sound. So if you've been using auto drummers or perhaps like me, you're not very good at programming drums, the auto drummer in Logic Pro is gonna be your friend because you're gonna have that nice combination of not having to spend hours crafting a manual drum kit and then playing it in by hand and then tweaking it and quantizing it because like me you're pretty bad at playing drums you've actually got an auto drummer that is going to give you the basic beats you can even customize the ghost notes i mean come on you can you can tell it how many ghost notes to play and that's something that i can't play as a non-drummer so there you go there's 11 things that i like there's a heap of other things that i really like about logic pro but i wanted to pare it down to the things that have impressed me over the two weeks that i've been using a lot quantization the ability to stretch that's the one we missed in fact that's why i was out of alignment let's go let's go with this because this is actually number 11 and that is stretch mode yeah you can actually stretch out a piece of audio or a piece of midi and that's going to really help those that like to do beat matching that like to have their projects really sort of aligned so if you've got a project that is at your weird wacky 97.78 whatever we had before you can bring in a, a beat that might be at 96 and then just a uh, just stretch it just change it make it what you want it to be so again i guess it comes back to the customization as well so i will go through those uh, because we went in a bit of a wacky order there the workflow the browser is great the mixer is great the interface having those panels your customization plugins are amazing the lessons and the user guide in there the tempos the time signatures the automation the auto drummer and stretch mode stretch mode and clobber no, stretch mode is all very cool that is a lot of good stuff, yeah. So you might be thinking right now, well, it's a no-brainer, John. So I'm, I'm, where do I sign up? I'm getting Logic Pro right now. But hold on, hit the brake, hit the brakes, do that record skip. Sorry, I don't have a sound effects board, so I have to make my own. But yeah, take a take a moment to just consider: Are any of those things things that you are going to use? If you're using something like GarageBand, and many of you probably are, if you're watching this uh, this show or, or listening to the audio version of this podcast. Do you need all of these bells and whistles? And the answer may be no, but they're cool and I want them anyway, and that's valid. Go for it. You may find that even though you don't use these sort of things now, you may want to in the future, and therefore you may want to check it out. That's also valid as well. Don't forget there's a free one-month trial for Logic Pro for iPad, so you can try before you buy it. I highly recommend you do that because why not? Why wouldn't you? If you're gonna if you're gonna dial into a subscription, why wouldn't you do that? But what are some of the things that it doesn't do either well or the way that I'd expected? Let's talk about those now. Now, spoiler alert, there's half as many. Because to be honest, uh, maybe I'm in the honeymoon period. Maybe I got my rose-colored glasses on, but I'm finding Logic Pro for iPad really cool and really usable. The number one thing is importing audio. So 
I've got more questions about this than anything else, and I've already made a video about it, so if you are wanting to know exactly how to import audio in Logic Pro, make sure that you're following me. In fact, I've got a mini site called logicipad.com, and if you go to logicipad.com, you can get a direct link into all of my Logic Pro tutorials and other videos, as well as a bunch of other resources. So Logic Pro, uh, logicipad.com for your Logic Pro iPad needs. But I've got a video that I've put out actually showing how to import your audio because unlike GarageBand or unlike a lot of other digital audio workstations where you actually can have a folder within the DAW to just drag and drop and store all of your samples, Logic Pro for iPad doesn't quite work that way. What you need to do is use your Files app. And look, this is both good and bad, but because it's a little clunkier to actually drag a file in because you've got to open the files app, find the file, click it, drag it in and put it in your project. Then you can do all sorts of cool things with it, as we talked about in the the good section. But it is harder to get your head around when you're first doing it. But I guess the advantage there is that you can then have your own file structure. You can have your own folder storage within the files app. You can store all your loops and samples however you like, and they're always available just to be brought in. The flip side, the negative of that, is what if you got your files stored on iCloud Drive, or what if you don't have access or you don't have the ability to store a lot of stuff there? It, it does get a little bit clunkier. So to be honest, that was the first thing that I had to look up. I was doing one of the lessons, and I'm like, I don't know how to in, import a file. And I had to go in and find it and it's really easy once you get the hang of it but it's not intuitive and it's one of the few things that isn't really intuitive the other thing that is going to be different for some folks is the way that you manage your projects because GarageBand has something called song sections where you can actually set up multiple song sections they're not perfect but it means so you can put your intro your verse your chorus your verse your chorus your bridge your you, you get the idea you can put in across the top of your project all the different sections and then as you're recording and then as you're editing and as you're mixing you can go to those different sections you can reorder sections you can add sections in it's a really easy way to actually have a, a workflow and I've been using that in GarageBand for a long time. Logic Pro doesn't have that. What it does have is the cycle mode, which works in a similar sort of way in that you can set your cycle up. So when you're recording, say, your chorus or a guitar solo, you can cycle through that and it'll play back that one section again and again. So that's pretty cool and that works okay. But for those that are maybe really married to song sections, just wanted to give you that warning that, it doesn't work in exactly the same way in Logic Pro. So you may just want to go in with your eyes open with that one. The number three negative, and this is again both a negative and a positive, is the complexity. So you've probably taken a look at Logic Pro or you've seen one of my videos or you're watching the video version as I'm scrolling around right now, which you can do if you're listening on the audio. You can go check out the video version. You've probably looked at it and gone, wow, when you first open it, there's just so much to do. There's so much going on that you can do. You've got so many different audio loops and patches and things in the browser. You've got so many things in the inspector that you can change with your quantization and a whole bunch of different settings. You've got so many things in the editor window that are unfamiliar if you haven't used these sort of things before. Your plugins are out the wazoo. And don't get me started on the mixer. The mixer... Like if you haven't used an actual console style mixer before, it can be pretty daunting to just look at all those knobs and dials and faders. Is anyone else like that when they were a kid and you saw those people in recording studios and you're like, how do they know which knob and dial and fader to put up and down? And then you realize it's actually really simple because every single one is just replicating the same thing, but for a different channel. So one's your guitar, one's your microphone, one's your kick drum, one's, yeah. So it's actually not as daunting as you may think. And I guess, as I said at the start, because you've got all of those lessons, you can learn this stuff pretty quickly and you can use it at two levels. So even though I say it's complex, there's a heap of complexity here, because you can kind of ignore most of it, it does kind of hold your hand as well. So you can use the presets, you can use the, the standard stuff that it throws on each channel and not ever touch a plugin or not ever touch a send or, or an aux bus. And just use your faders to go up and down. Or you can go completely old school. You can completely ignore the fact that there's a mixer and mix like you've always done in GarageBand or in other DAWs, just right out on your arrangement screen. So there are other options. You're not going to be stuck in, but 
yeah, you do need to know going in that it is going to be more complex. One of the greatest advantages of GarageBand and, I mean, other simple DAWs, but GarageBand kind of takes the cake in terms of simple stuff, is it's simple. Is it so easy? And the reason a lot of people have said, oh, now that Logic Pro is out, everyone's going to be deleting GarageBand, and I bet you're never going to use GarageBand again, Pete. But that's not the case because I can see a lot of value in a lot of the thing, a lot of the simplicity of GarageBand. And for me, when I'm just going to go and pick it up and go with it, I want to use GarageBand, which actually brings me to my next point here, which is that there is no iPhone compatibility for Logic Pro. Now, if you've looked at it, you kind of intuitively know why, because if you look at the way the interface works, having this on an iPhone screen, even a large iPhone screen, would be virtually impossible. Forget it if you've got chungus, chunky fingers like me, but even if you've got lovely, slim, tapered little pencil fingers, I don't think it's going to work. And I think Apple knew that going in. So they have designed this to be on a screen that's at least a 9, 10 inch size, and even better, on a 12.9 inch iPad, which is another one that I didn't actually have here, but I guess it's the, it's the compatibility issue, uh, and I'm adding to my notes as we talk, the is only available for iPads that have an A12 Bionic processor or better, and it tends to work the best on the latest iPad Pros, those with an M1 or an M2 chip. So it does kind of limit what devices you can use it on. So for me, I have, I am lucky enough to have an iPad Pro M2, and I've, I've got the iPad from 2020, the iPad Pro with the A, uh, A12 Bionic chip in it. But I've also got some other older iPads, and it just means that when I'm using them, if I'm out and about with my smaller iPads, I'm not going to have access to it. And when I'm out and about with no iPad, with just my iPhone, I don't have access to my music. Where it's in GarageBand, I always did. So that is definitely going to be a drawback there. The other thing that's related to that, that a lot of folks have been uh, talking about, is the Logic Mac compatibility. So one of the things that Apple said when they first released or first announced Logic Pro was that it would have full round trip compatibility. So that means if you start a project on Logic for Mac, you can then open it in Logic for iPad, make your changes, update your things, record new things, mix, and then you can send it back to logic on your Mac and you're all good to go. Now, whilst that is true, the challenge is that if you're using plugins that are only available for the iPad, uh, they ain't going to work on your Mac. If you're using plugins, VSTs, audio units that are not available on the iPad, only on the Mac, they're not going to work on the iPad. So you're not really getting that full round trip compatibility if you're the sort of person that likes to use a lot of more advanced third party plugins. That being said, if, like me, you're kind of a stock guy as well as a stocky guy, you're not going to run into too many trouble, too many problems. So if you're recording and you're just using the stock compressor and maybe some reverb and some delay and some compression, you're okay. You, you'll be fine and you'll be able to move your things around between Logic on the Mac and Logic on the iPad. But the, the, the compatibility is there, but it's not for some folks. So you do need to keep that in mind. The uh, instrument selection is is one thing that I've got more feedback on, and I probably agree that even though you've got direct access to all of your different instrument patches, there's something about that garage band visual way of selecting your instruments that was super appealing, like just going to your amp by tapping the picture of an amp, going to your guitars by tapping the picture of a guitar, keyboards, keyboards, strings, strings, Would you get the gist. So having that visual interface and then going straight into it is is a lot easier than the way that you manage it in Logic Pro. Everything is still there in Logic Pro. In fact, a heap more is in Logic Pro. You've got the ability to change the different way that you're inputting your instruments. You can use drum pads, you can use the fretboard, the guitar fretboard on any instrument. So it's all there. And you've got a heap of like really good studio instruments. You've got your brass, you've got your studio strings. There's a heap in there but it's just not as intuitive in terms of how to get to it. And this is something that I've found when I tried to move to GarageBand on Mac or Logic on Mac, is that, yeah, I missed that that feel. I missed that simplicity of just going, I want a keyboard. I'm going to tap on this big picture of a piano, and then I'm going to choose which keyboard I want, and then I'm going to put it on my track. So I wanted to mention that because it is something that will take some getting used to. You'll get there, you'll be fine, you'll, you'll adjust to the workflow because as I said in my positives, the workflow is amazing and I think uh, for most people, you'll adjust, you'll adapt, you'll be fine. 
The final thing I would be remiss not to mention that it is a subscription model and that is simply not going to resonate with some people. And that's okay. I know, I know. You're already in the comments. You're already uh, emailing me, Pete at studiolivetoday.com. More than happy to hear from you. And I mean that. Uh, just, you know, you don't have to flame me. But if you, want to, if you want to give me all the reasons why a subscription model is not good and why you don't like it and why it should be illegal and all the rest of it, then that, that's fine. At the end of the day, though, it's the way that this app is being put out there. For now, will it change in the future? Unlikely. We can hope. We can dream. My personal preference would have been to be able to buy the app. So I thought the best thing would have been to have the option to either rent it monthly or yearly or buy it outright. I would have bought it. If it was $199, heck, if it was $299, which it is in Australia, like Logic on a Mac is $299 Australian. And I spent that for Logic on the Mac. And I'm happy that I did. And I would have spent that for Logic on iPad. But... The reason that, that, that Apple have done this is likely that they want to lower the barrier of entry because Logic Pro on, Logic on a Mac does have a pretty high barrier of entry. Not a lot of people have $200 lying around to throw at something, but people have $5 a month, yeah, and you know what? Maybe you don't subscribe to, maybe you, you, you pause your Netflix, your Hulu, your Apple TV, your Disney Plus and spend some time creating instead of consuming. Man. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's an option. I know. I don't mean to be patronising, and I know that for, for some folks, m- most people are somewhere in between. Most people are like me, where you're like, look, don't love it, but it is what it is. You're in that 80%. There's going to be 10% of people that will defend it <laughs> and will say, no, it's, it's, it's 100% great. It's the best thing ever. And then there'll be 10% at the other end that will say, this is evil, horrible, corporate greed, worst thing ever. So yeah, w- wherever you sit is totally fine. But it becomes your own personal choice. If you don't want to have a subscription model for your digital audio workstation, then perhaps Logic Pro is not for you. So I wanted to put that out there as the final point. What do you think, though? I'd love to get your feedback. Honestly, would. There's a few ways you can do that. You can leave a comment if you're watching the video version of this one. I'd love to hear from you there. If you're listening on the podcast, as I mentioned before, you can reach out to me. All the ways to contact me are over at studiolivetoday.com. And you can also go to logicipad.com and uh, jump into all the other tutorial videos. I've got my first look video there already. I've got how to import your own audio files, as we talked about earlier. And I'll be adding a heap more over the coming weeks and months. So if you're in the future, there's probably already a plethora of Logic Pro stuff over there. If you're listening on the audio version, I'd love to give love for you to give me a rating uh, and maybe a review. So a five-star rating and a review, always appreciated. And uh, if you'd like to let other folks know about the Studio Live Today podcast, I would always appreciate that. Thank you very much for listening or watching. As we say at the end of everything around here on Studio Live Today, please, this week, be kind to yourself, be kind to others, and keep creating, maybe in Logic Pro for iPad. See you next time.